Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about some potential criticisms of Blaise Pascal's discourse on the machine. Uh, now, if you are familiar at all with uh, Blaise Pascal uh, and the probably the most famous portion of his book, The Pensée, or The Thoughts, uh, then you will have heard of, uh, of Pascal's wager, or what's more properly called the discourse on the machine. Uh, and this is his, uh, his pragmatic explanation of how we ought to come to believe things uh, for which we cannot have sufficient reason or evidence. Uh, and so he proposes this, uh, this wager that everyone is relatively familiar with, uh, and more importantly, uh, puts forward a method of getting ourselves to genuinely believe something uh, rather than simply saying that we do, admitting it, uh, admitting it merely, uh, uh, merely as as precepts of the mind, but actually internalizing these beliefs. Um, and so, uh, if you aren't familiar with Pascal's discourse on the machine, I highly recommend you read the whole thing. It's not terribly long, and it's relatively findable. Um, I, if you're wanting to pick up the book, I highly recommend this edition, um, translated and edited by Roger Aryev. Um, fantastically done and well organized uh, unlike a lot of editions of the pensee yeah. um or if you would prefer you can familiarize yourself with the uh, with the idea in my two previous lectures on blaise pascal uh you'll find those linked in the description and up in the cards as well uh the first of them goes over pascal's wager simply the more uh the more well-known part the how to make this practical decision and then the second discusses the rest of the discourse on the machine which is this process of how we can get ourselves to believe something naturally and mechanically, as he says. And so um, from this point forward, I'm going to assume that anyone watching is relatively familiar uh, with Pascal and with at least this part, this discourse on the machine and his arguments therein. And so if you are familiar with this, great, continue. If not, uh, go ahead and give those videos a watch and then come right back here. So there are two major points of criticism that we can level against Blaise Pascal. Both of these are from a broadly evidentialist epistemological perspective. That is, that we ought to come to beliefs on the basis of evidence and arguments rather than mere pragmatic decision making. And these two criticisms can, uh, can coexist. You can criticism Pascal in both of these ways, or you can merely criticize him in one way or the other and accept the other part of his argument. And so I want to look at, uh, at these two criticisms separately to see if we can, uh, we can understand them independently, because again, as uh, at least some of the philosophers that I'm going to be pointing to, um, will criticize him in one respect, but accept the other respect and vice versa. So first, um, I want to look at the, uh, at a more, um, uh, a, a criticism, which is more about the more commonly uh, considered part of Pascal's argument, that is uh, the wager that we're re all relatively familiar with. And I think the best place to find this criticism in particular is in someone like C.S. Lewis. Uh, so C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a, an essay called Man or Rabbit, and this is in his book God in the Dock, which I have somewhere. A few moments later. Okay, well, I can't find it. Uh, it must not be in my office anywhere. Anyway, um, not important, really. Um, you don't want to know how much time off camera I just spent looking for that. Anyway, um, so this essay uh, explains why Lewis thinks that it is important to pursue knowledge by evidence and by arguments. And so the reason that this is a counterargument against Pascal is that Pascal holds that evidence is neither necessary nor sufficient for coming to believe something in a rational way. That you can believe something for practical reasons. You can come to believe uh, because it's the right thing to do from a practical standpoint rather than from a theoretical standpoint. You can come to believe something not because you have reason to think that it's true, but because you have a reason to choose to believe it. At least if you don't have a reason to think otherwise, and as long as you uh, understanding that evidence is not actually going to get you there. In other words, he is ceding ground to, uh, to skeptics, particularly Peronian skeptics in his time, but uh, skeptics today, somebody who is skeptical about the idea of God, somebody who like somebody like an agnostic, that sort of thing. And so Pascal is willing to cede ground and say that we can, uh, we can reasonably or rationally believe something in the absence of evidence because we have to decide somehow and that 
something like a wager, right? What do we stand to gain? What versus what do we stand to lose is a perfectly reasonable way of making that decision of what to believe. Now, Lewis is going to disagree. And he's primarily going to point out uh, that we have an ethical responsibility as human beings, as the kind of creatures that we are, to come to know things rationally, intellectually, through our minds, through argument, and through evidence. Uh, and so he points out that um, we often want to skip ahead to why can't I, uh, he asks this question over and over in, this, in the essay, um, can't you lead a good life without believing in Christianity? He was trying to say, trying to skip over this process of trying to find out what's true and just go ahead to, well, let's just act practically within the world, act pragmatically, do what we think is right. But he points out again and again throughout this text, it's a very short essay, but it's very, uh, it's very circular. He keeps going around and, uh, and hitting the same points again in a sort of hermeneutic method here, um, which is, uh, which is a, a process of, uh, of writing is also a reading of going through a text or through a topic. And then each time you get back to the initial point, going a, a layer deeper and a layer deeper. And so it's first time around, he points out that in order to just get on with doing the right thing or living a good life, without finding out what's true about the world or not, you're, you're jumping ahead. You can't just do that. Because in order to know that you're doing the right thing, you need to know certain things about the world. He uses an example. Um, so he says, quote, Suppose you found a man on the point of starvation and wanted to do the right thing. If you had no knowledge of medical science, you would probably give him a large, solid meal. And as a result, your man would die. This is what comes of working in the dark. And his point here is to show that in order to know what the right thing is, you need to know certain things about the world. In order to know what the right thing to believe is, you have to know what's true. In order to know how to act within the world, you have to know, well, how you're interacting, what kinds of things and people you're interacting with. Are we merely finite, limited, uh, merely corporeal beings? Right? Are we just our bodies? Or are we body and soul composites? Are we naturally immortal? Are we going to live forever? Are we, dis are we destined to, uh, to be in the presence of God? Do we bear the Imago Dei? All of these things will, will deeply affect how we ought to interact with the world. And if you're going to skip ahead to, well, I just want to do what's right. You're not, you're, you're, as he says, you're shirking your responsibility to be human, to be rational. Because we are, after all, primarily, first and foremost, rational animals. He says you are far more like an ostrich burying its head in the sand, trying to avoid the question of what is right and what is, uh, what is true. And he also points out, he goes on to point out, that not only is this irresponsible to, to jump to these conclusions without being absolutely sure from an intellectual standpoint, but he further says that, uh, like I said, it's, it's insufficiently human. You're acting like a rabbit, trying to avoid the truth of the matter, trying to avoid figuring things out. And he especially is targeting this at the person who says, well, maybe I shouldn't bother about this whole matter of religion. Maybe I should simply withhold judgment, as a lot of Pascal's interlocutors would have preferred, to withhold judgment and to not commit one way or another. And in that respect, he agrees with Pascal that we do need to commit one way or another. We actually have to investigate these matters. It is part of our obligation as human beings. However, Lewis is insistent that the only proper way of investigating these matters is rationally. We have to come to an intellectual conclusion of the matter. But it is not sufficient to come to a practical solution to the question. And so this is the part that he vehemently disagrees with Pascal about. He subtly disagrees that Pascal thinks that if you can't come to a rational conclusion based on evidence and arguments, then all you have is practical, deli uh, practical deliberation, practical decision making, in which case you might as well decide in that way. Lewis would say to the contrary, if you can't figure it out, if you cannot come to a rational conclusion on the basis of arguments and evidence, you need to try harder because there cannot be anything more important. Now, to the other criticism, I want to, I'll, I'll hold off to see on what aspects of Pascal's argument that, that Lewis agrees on wholeheartedly. 
uh, I want to look at the other criticism that I wanted to have uh, that I had in mind, uh, which is instead of criticizing the wager or method of making a decision, um, other philosophers have criticized uh, the the rest of the machine, this process of getting yourself to believe in a natural and mechanical sort of way. And I want to point you in particular to uh, an interview uh, from the New York Times blog uh, with a philosopher uh, named Daniel Garber. He's an atheist, uh, but he is fairly um, amicable and friendly towards ideas of religion. He does study extensively the philosophy of religion, and so he's familiar with the topics and he's familiar with uh, with the uh, with the arguments surrounding Pascal in a way that goes beyond simply understanding Pascal's wager as an argument for God's existence, which, again, if you watch the previous videos, you know that I think that idea is quite silly. And so um, he addresses Pascal's wager in particular. Uh, he says, this is in, in contrast to the point of, he doesn't think the, the wager is in any way disingenuous or skipping ahead or anything like that, the same kind of criticism Lewis has. He says instead, quote, but the real worry about the argument comes at a later moment, I think. It is important to remember that Pascal's wager isn't an argument for the truth of the proposition that God exists, but an argument for why we should want to believe that God exists. It only tells us that it is to our advantage to believe, and in this way makes us want to believe but it doesn't give us any reasons to think that God actually exists. In a way, I'm already convinced that I should want to believe. But there's a step from there to actual belief, and that's a step I cannot personally negotiate. Pascal tells us, roughly, that we should adopt the life of the believer, and eventually the belief will come. And maybe it will, but that seems too much like self-deception to me. And I think that Garber is... Right, especially to certainly to an extent, that Pascal's machine is a way of, in Pascal's own words, a way of diminishing the passions that keep us from believing what we have determined is the right thing to believe, that which we want to. And so for Pascal, this works whether you're coming to the conclusion rationally on the basis of arguments, because he thinks that is possible, or whether you're coming to it practically and you can only decide that to believe in God on the basis of wh where do you stand to gain? What do you stand to lose? I mean, the wager, so to speak, a roll of the dice, if you will. Either way, he thinks that there's another step, which is actually coming to believe, getting yourself to believe some something in uh, by habituating yourself into acting as if it were true. Now, if you act as if God exists and you continuously do this, you are effectively, Pascal thinks, choosing to believe you are in effect uh what maybe garber's way of uh saying it would be you are conditioning yourself to believe and there is of course a possibility here that you are convincing yourself to believe in something which turns out not to be true and so you are ultimately deceiving yourself now of course pascal is a catholic a christian in general and a catholic in particular and he holds that while this is perhaps possible and that you could, in principle, psychologically condition yourself into believing in something that isn't true, he also is open to the possibility of miracles. And so part of the point of this machine, this natural and mechanical process of getting yourself to believe, is to sweep away any barriers that you might have to believing in God. Uh, barriers that you may have put into place, consciously or unconsciously, to God giving you the gift of faith. Because he does think that this is, in large part, a miraculous process, one that is instigated and guided by God. Um, that was not only a Catholic, but a Jansenist, who are quite deterministic in their, uh, in their beliefs about the divine will. Uh, and so all we are doing is getting out of our own way, and that's what we're doing with this machine. We are getting, we're at least intending to get, our, get out of our own way. However... Garber's concern is that this process is somewhat like Lewis. Coming to convince ourselves of something that we know we do not know with any kind of certainty is actually true. We have a reason to want to believe it, and he's, as he says uh, in the interview, sympathetic to that point. But he also points out that, uh, that convincing oneself of what one knows that one does not have sufficient reason to think is a kind of betrayal of our rational capacity as human beings, once again. So he says, 
What worries me more than what God might think is the possibility that I may corrupt my soul by deceiving myself into believing something just because I want it to be true. For a philosopher, that's a kind of damnation in this life. In contrast, I'm adding in contrast to damnation in the afterlife, this throws off Pascal's calculus of infinite reward and infinite, uh, infinite loss. Because if we have this kind of damnation in this life, if one is entirely giving up what it is to be human, then that is a kind of, uh, a kind of infinite loss, loss of everything that one is. All right, so let's get back a little bit. Let's step back and look at what these two agree with Pascal about. And I'll stick with Garber for right now. And Garber is, uh, as I said, is, as he indicated in the, in the first part that I read, certainly sympathetic to the idea that we would want to and probably even should want to believe in God. And that the wager makes a solid point that if your only live options, and this is a big if, but if your only live options are atheism or Christian theism, then of course you should choose to believe in God if such a choice is possible. So Garber agrees with the wager, as far as I can tell, uh, from this interview and some other things he's written on the subject. He agrees with that part of the argument, that, that the practical decision to make is to choose to believe in God if that choice can be made, and if it can be made in an intellectually honest sort of way. It's just that he doesn't think that it can be made in an intellectually honest sort of way. If you're also, I, I will note, I have, I have some, uh, some criticisms of what Garber has to say as well. And there's a, uh, an essay that I've written in the comments, uh, linked and in the comments in the, um, the description linked below. Uh, um, and, uh, and this is, again, I think this is uh, a development on the dialogue between some of Garber's position and some of Pascal's position. Um, but given this common ground, I think that, that we can develop perhaps more common ground than we might think, but I digress. We can look as well to Lewis and the parts on which Lewis agrees in Man or Rabbit and in Elsewhere. So he does, he does point out near the end of the essay in Man or Rabbit uh, that the mere choice to do something is not sufficient uh, to fully internalize it. And insofar as he says this, he agrees with Pascal. And he does think that we need a kind of divine infusion like I was just talking about in terms of Pascal with this miraculous gift of grace, that uh, he says that um, um, mere morality, he says, is not the end of life. You are made for something quite different from that. Morality is indispensable, but the divine life, which gives itself to us and which calls us to be gods, intends for us something in which morality will be swallowed up. So the mere actions of belief are merely a starting point. And this is why we, this is uh, to, to tie scripture into this, because uh, Lewis cites this elsewhere as well. Uh, this is why in, uh, in the first letter of the Corinthians, St. Paul says that faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love. That faith and hope in light of God and in, in in heaven and the new creation and the resurrection, the eschaton, faith and hope pass away and leave room only for love, which is the giving and receiving in the eternal presence of God. And so for, for Lewis, he does certainly agree with the second part of Pascal's argument, the machine, this, this, this process of habituation. We also find uh, in uh, in Mere Christianity, his, uh, possibly his best apologetics text, Lewis's best apologetics text, um, uh, in the title, in the chapter titled Let's Pretend. He also gives a great deal of credit to Pascal's idea of uh, habituation as a means of coming to believe something. Because, again, Lewis, just like Pascal, doesn't think that mere propositions are enough to get us to believe in God. We actually do need a process of habituation to get ourselves to genuinely believe something and internalize it and make it fundamentally part of ourselves in a way that syllogisms cannot do. And so he says that part of this process is to pretend that we are Christian, pretend that we are Christ, pretend that we believe that God exists. 
And so eventually we will come to actually believe that God exists. And so eventually, even further than that, we will genuinely become Christian in both the, the precise sense of believing in God, but then further than that, in the moral sense of, of living as a Christian ought to live. And so what we have here is, uh, all told, a twofold criticism of Pascal's argument. We have, uh, we have Garber, who criticizes uh, the, um, the machine, this natural and mechanical process by which we get ourselves to believe in God, but accepts that we should want to believe in God if we can do so in an intellectually honest sort of way. And then we have Lewis, who is just as much of an evidentialist as Clifford is, and insists on the importance and primacy of human reason and intellectual virtue and all of these things, but accepts this latter part, this way of getting ourselves to believe in, the in this naturally and mechanical, natural and mechanical sort of way, but that he rejects this idea that we should come to believe, or we can reasonably come to believe in a pragmatic sort of way, and that if we can't come to a rational determination, then we should simply try harder because it's the, perhaps the most important thing to do is to discover, does God exist? What is our role in relation to that which is fundamental to the cosmos? So uh, that is, I think, a couple of, uh, of, of great criticisms worth looking at uh, for uh, for Pascal's discourse on the machine, his pragmatic outlook on epistemology of religion, um, looking at two separate aspects of Pascal's argument. Uh, so hopefully we've uh, we've learned something for this, and uh, hopefully this gives us more to think about in terms of how we come to believe things, how we uh, and how we come to really not just believe things propositionally, but really come to genuinely internalize our beliefs and act them out in this practical way that Pascal is so concerned about, and whether Pascal has it right or whether somebody like Lewis or Garber has it right, um, is hopefully something that we can figure out because, well, we don't have forever to figure it out. Anyway, thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.